we will be discussing uh, the current affairs for the 9th of march now there are some very important topics that we'll be discussing today such as equalization levy then uh, stagflation and digital media ethics these are the most important topics there can be questions from the prelims perspective over here definitely also one more topic which has been very much in the news and is important from geography point of view to know the names of places in and around that particular uh, area is this topic important okay okay moving on now also we are uh, we'll be discussing edible oil prices and why they've increased so much and there's another uh, dream to, uh, there's a scheme currently for uh, promoting entrepreneurship among women also motor vehicle agreement which uh, for which talks have been going on for now about 5 uh, years and uh, we'll talk about a supercomputer also what it does stagflation first topic now what is stagflation in general all these components which have been given over here these represent when uh, stagflation occurs there is inflation and there is lower growth low growth represents stagflation also there is a higher rate of unemployment and there is a recession okay and there is a poor implementation of government policies because the government doesn't have enough revenues there is a drop in the revenues of the government why if there is low gdp if there is lower growth then there will also be automatically lower realization of revenue and if there is lower realization of revenue then there will be poor implementation of policies automatically if there is lower amount of growth there will also be higher un- unemployment there won't be new jobs for people and already the jobs that are existing are also under threat okay now why are we talking about stagflation currently as russia's invasion of ukraine is set to enter into the third week the economic costs of the conflict in eastern europe they threatened to stall any recovery which the covid-19 had disrupted covid-19 had disrupted the growth rate of various economies now it is believed that this russia ukraine war can again uh, disrupt this growth this nascent growth which has returned back after covid has gone or uh, the threat from covid has reduced stagflation is a situation of slow economic growth and relatively higher unemployment or economic stagnation which is at the same time accompanied by rising prices inflation and slow economic growth this is nothing but stagflation stagnation in terms of economic growth plus inflation in terms of cost of items if you take it apart you'll get stagflation it can be alternately defined as a period of inflation combined with the decline in the gross domestic product like what we spoke of till now stagflation occurs when money supply is expanding while supply is being constrained now the supply might be constrained because of multiple reasons it could be because of government decision to ban imports or government's decisions which have disrupted production or even increase in the crude oil prices or wars which have disrupted the supply chains like supply of sunflower for edible oil or supply of wheat for consumption for biscuits etc so anything can result in stagflation now what is the current global situation while the expansive financial sanctions imposed on russia by the us and its western allies have sent the value of the ruble see the value of ruble till as late as 2005 was around 1 ru- uh, ruble is equal to around 2 rupees today the value of 1 ruble is equivalent to around 70 paise so you can see how the value of the ruble has depreciated we spoke about depreciation and devaluation please uh, find out the uh, difference between the two from uh, 
uh, one of the classes earlier. Now, the ruble has plunged by more than 60% against the dollar since the start of the conflict. The war-led disruptions to supply and sanctions have sent the prices of several key commodities soaring from wheat and corn to metals such as nickel, aluminium and even crude oil and gas. All these components have increased terribly. And because of this increase, it is causing a, a situation of a tight supply and it is causing stagflation, inflation. Now, Brent crude futures. This is an indication of the uh, supply shortage. Any futures would give you an indication of how much of a demand there exists for that commodity in the future, in the next month. So Brent crude futures surged to a high not seen since 2008. The price of natural gas has also risen sharply in Europe and concerns amid concerns that supplies from Russia could be hit uh, on account of European nations agreeing to a US proposal to shut the tap on Russian energy exports or uh, through retaliatory sanctions by Moscow. Why? Because Europe already supplies on Russia for about 40% of its gas requirements. If either Moscow shuts it down or if Europe shuts down the supply of Russian gas and Russian crude oil, the prices will increase drastically. Russia supplies Europe about 40% of its gas requirements, roughly a quarter of its oil and almost half of its coal needs. And an embargo on energy supplies from Russia could send all these uh, commodities prices higher, which will automatically increase the electricity costs. That in turn would hit the consumers as well as businesses and factories, forcing them to either raise their prices or even temporarily shut down operations. See, if these high prices are going to hit the consumers, if the prices of commodities increase, then demand for them will fall. If demand for them falls, growth will fall. And already these prices are high. And if the prices increase further, it will result in even higher inflation. So can you see what is happening over here? These are the perfect, uh, this is the perfect background for stagflation to occur. Inflation in the euro area had already accelerated to 5.8% in February, mainly on account of 31% surge in energy prices and uptrend in the oil prices. So this will worsen considerably. That is what, you know, analysts are predicting and that is what the Brent crude futures are also suggesting. The IMF also in January cut its forecast for global growth to 4.4% due to the Omicron variant. So the world itself hasn't recovered from Omicron caused disruption in supply. Now, now rising energy prices and supply disruptions uh, will worsen the situation even further. And hence the IMF warned that the war in Ukraine, it posed grave risks to the global recovery. Okay, we discussed what the IMF had said earlier. Now, how do you cure stagflation? What is the cure for stagflation? We can't say that definitively this is the cure for stagnation. There is no definitive, definitive way out of it. But what we can do is, you have to try and ensure that there is more growth in the economy. Try to provide more supply of the goods. Try to ensure that the supply chain disruptions are closed. Disruptions need to be stopped. Now, if these disruptions are stopped, then the supply will increase. If the supply increases, growth will increase. And automatically, when the supply increases, the prices of these commodities will start normalizing. Only when there is higher demand for an item will its price go high. If there is enough supply of that item, its price will start automatically getting corrected. It will reduce a little. Now, because there won't be any additional inflation and there will be higher growth, then the government, in that condition, the government can have a dear money policy. 
we had discussed this earlier dear money policy which means that it will increase the interest rates thereby sucking out the excess liquidity from the economy when it sucks out the excess liquidity from the economy the inflation will start further reducing and it will come into control okay so please uh, this is such a huge task that has to be done hence what the governments can actually do is that prevent any situation from turning into a stagflation try to resolve a situation as and when it arises itself okay now moving on india and china to hold a fresh talks now india and china they have resolved a lot of issues uh, when the galwan clash happened in uh, uh, may i believe of 2020 uh there were further clashes in several different places such as in debsang plains such as in uh, pangong so such as in gogra and then in hot springs there were several areas where further uh, fighting happened and uh, hence even when you know the troops were pulled back from galwan troops were pulled back from galwan in august itself of 2020 however even when pro- troops were pulled back from galwan these places continued to have uh tense situations you know the armies were confronting each other india and china have mutually uh decided to hold fresh round of commander level talks at the indian side of chushul meeting point on march 11th the two sides have so far held 14 rounds of talks till now this will be the 15th level 15th round with disengagement undertaken on the north and south sides of the pangong so lake pangong so we have had a disengagement first disengagement galwan also we had a disengagement and gogra areas also we had a disengagement so all these three areas we had a disengagement however a disengagement is still not done in hot springs the focus is on disengagement from patrolling point in hot springs while taking forward the comprehensive disengagement and deescalation efforts of forward Since the standoff began in May 2020 the two sides have held series of talks at different levels political diplomatic and military and as a part of these agreements like what we said in Galwan there was disengagement in July 2020 itself and Pangong so both the ends north bank as well as the south bank there was a disengagement and then from the Gogra area later on there was uh, disengagement hence the only area that is left from disengagement is hot springs uh, there are other areas such as demchok and debsang also which are in uh, the upper part of ladakh uh, i'm sure you must have seen the map like this this is kashmir this upper region these are known as demchok and uh, debsang plains they are over here Uh, while india has been insisting on a comprehensive disengagement and deescalation of the situation in eastern ladakh india wants to discuss disengagement in both uh, debsang and demchok also while china does not want these things to be a part of the discussion rather china wants to keep uh, its discussion only limited to hot springs currently that is the difference in the view point now india and china have several uh, mechanisms in order to resolve disputes if you notice as compared to the line of control which is the on the border that we share with pakistan the line of actual control we don't have any firing we don't have any skirmishes often and usually whatever uh, conflict happens that also happens in a hand to hand combat Uh, it does not involve any lethal weapons as such now 
one of the the first agreement that was agreed uh, between india and china was the border peace and tranquility agreement it provides the framework for border security so between the parties until the final determination is made on the border issue until the borders are decided uh this allows for a, this particular agreement allows for a peace to be there the parties agreed to reduce troop levels to levels compatible with good relations they agree that india china boundary question shall be resolved through peaceful and friendly consultations and neither side shall use force this is one of the agreements which has ensured that you know this line of actual control is very different from line of control and there is peace over here rather than using artillery shelling firing and all special representative mechanisms okay this actually india and china signed their strategic partnership in the year 2003 please remember this that india and china have a strategic partnership already though it might be surprising uh so as a part of this india and china set up the special representative mechanism uh i am sure you know that the special representative from india is the national security advisor who has been given cabinet rank while from china it is the state councilor whose name is mr wang yi who is the external affairs minister from china it was set up to explore from the political perspective the framework of boundary settlement both these people are political people they are not military representatives okay now special representative mechanism was responsible for the agreement on political parameters and guiding principles for the boundary settlement in 2005 they were the ones who made this agreement possible later on in 2012 we had the working mechanism for consultation and coordination now this is headed by joint secretary level officials from both china and india and they help out the special representative for better talks it was established in the year 2012 as an institutional mechanism for consultation and coordination for management of india china border areas now this is the most important agreement border defense cooperation agreement please remember that the border defense cooperation agreement happened between india and china and not the others okay now objective of this border defense cooperation agreement was to avoid border tensions and army face offs along the line of actual control by deciding that neither side will use military capability to attack the other side like what we spoke this particular agreement it talks about the different mechanisms that can be implemented for better border cooperation such as having co- common flag meetings having regular personal meetings having hotlines and meetings between different representatives at various fora okay also this particular agreement includes exchange of information joint smuggling efforts in order to prevent smuggling from happening assistance uh in locating trans border movement of people illegal immigration and then disease transmission across the border and all of that it talks about a lot of cooperation between india and china at the border levels next okay the most important topic and the topic that i feel there will definitely be a question in 2022 okay please read the intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code I have discussed the digital media ethics code in detail over here. It's very important. Also read the intermediary guidelines. Now, the reason why it is in the news is because the Information and Broadcasting Ministry has approached the Directorate of Information and Public Relations of all the states and union territories to initiate an awareness for sensitizing the officials to the code of ethics and procedure and safeguards in relation to the digital media ethics. code uh, so we will discuss more on this code of ethics in uh, currently now okay now uh, so please remember that this digital media ethics code is under the implementation of ministry of information and broadcasting while the intermediary guidelines are under the ministry of information and electronics 
Meti and this is under Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. Okay. Uh, now, these particular rules, they provide for a code of ethics to be followed by digital news publishers and OTT platforms. News publishers and OTT platforms. These are the two people who will be under this code of ethics. The rules institute a three-tier structure for regulating these publishers. At the first level, you have self-regulation by the publishers themselves. And then at the second level, you have a self-regulation by association of publishers. And the third level, you have oversight by the ministry. Central government over here means the information and broadcasting ministry. So you have three levels of uh, regulations for these uh, publishers, digital news media publishers and OTT platforms. Now, what is the code of ethics? For publishers of news and current affairs, digital media, the following codes apply. Norms of journalistic conduct formulated by the Press Council of India, Program of Code under the Cable Televisions Networks Regulation Act. Okay, for pu publishers of curated content, this curated content is nothing but OTT. Hence, for news media, news and current affairs, see over here, these bunch of people have a different set of rules and these bunch of people have a different set of rules. For the publishers of news and current affairs, these codes will apply. While for curated content, which is nothing but OTT, the rules prescribe the code of ethics. This code requires the publishers to classify the content in specific age-appropriate categories, restrict the access of age-inappropriate content for children and implement a age verification mechanism. Okay. Now, also, there is a need to exercise due discretion in featuring content affecting the sovereignty and integrity of India, national security, and likely disturb the public order of India. All these are uh, conditions that the code of ethics, this is the code of ethics for OTT. You need to have age appropriate restrictions. And you need to also prevent uh, content that affects the sovereignty and integrity of India. And it should also take into consideration India's multiple races uh, before, you know, affecting their beliefs and practices. It should also make content more accessible to disabled persons. This is what is needed from OTT platforms. This is the code of ethics. Grievance redressal mechanism. What is the grievance redressal mechanism? Any person aggrieved by the content of a publisher may file a complaint with the publisher who must address it within 15 days. If the person is not satisfied with the resolution, the complaint or the complaint is not addressed within the specified time, the person may escalate the complaint to association of publishers who must also address. Now, this grievance redressal is applicable to both digital media houses, news as well as OTT. Over here, we had a different uh, code of ethics for both of them. Over here, you have a very similar grievance redressal mechanism for both of them. The complaint will be considered by an interdepartmental committee constituted by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting if escalated by the association under certain conditions or referred to by the ministry itself. We had earlier spoken of the regulatory mechanism that exists. We had a three-tier regulatory structure for any of these publishers. So we are just expanding that grievance addressal mechanism and looking into what happens in detail over here. Now, oversight by the ministry. The Ministry of Information and Broadcasting will publish a charter for self-regulating bodies, including the code of practices, issue appropriate advisories and orders to all the publishers, have powers to block content, on an emergency basis. Please remember this condition. This is available with the ministry itself. Information and Broadcasting Ministry hence can block content on an emergency basis. However, please remember that any directions for blocking the content will be reviewed by a committee headed by the cabinet secretary. This is the safeguard that they have. 
okay so these are the rules that that will be applicable for uh, digital media uh, for digital media let it be digital news publishers or let it be ott platforms moving on equalization levy justifying the 2% equalization levy imposed by india on the supply of services by multinational enterprises the finance minister had said that it is a sovereign right to collect taxation on any of the operations in the country okay now what is this equalization levy we had a question on this equalization levy in the year 2018 in the prelims so it's important now equalization levy is also one of the indirect taxes what are indirect taxes the person on whom the tax is levied and the person who is paying the actual tax are different as opposed to a direct uh, tax india was one of the first countries to introduce a 6% equalization levy in 2016 but the levy was restricted only to online advertisement services so all those firms which were indulging in online advertisement services they had to pay a levy of around 6% fee from having the equalization levy india also introduced a digital tax for around 2% in 2020 for foreign companies which are selling goods and services in an online manner to customers in india and that have an annual revenue of more than 2 crores okay now what is the applicability of this uh, digital tax this is also a part of the equalization levy however 6% is for online advertisers while 2% is for sellers of goods and services online now applicability of the levy is that india has expanded the scope of that equalization levy over the last few years to include non resident digital entities while the levy applied only to digital advertising services till 2019 20 Uh, was at the rate of 6% the government in 2020 like what we spoke of over here had increased the scope to impose 2% levy on non residents e- non resident e-commerce players with a turnover of 2 crores now the scope was further widened by the finance act to cover e-commerce supply of services or services when any activity takes place online it is any activity now that takes place in an online manner and uh, for companies that have more than 2 crores turnover since may of 2021 this equalization levy also includes any entities which have a uh, business with more than 3 lakh users in india so not just the 2 crore uh, annual revenues but rather users uh, more more users than 3 lakh people in india they will also be a uh, charge an equalization levy of around 2% uh, okay thus initially it was launched for 6% but now it has uh, grown to include other players also uh, non resident e-commerce players uh, e-commerce uh, players doing sales online with a revenue of over 2 crores and then also e-commerce services which are doing businesses with more than 3 lakh users in india Okay. When will the tax not apply? Offshore e-commerce firms that sell through an Indian arm will not have to pay any taxes. Equalization levy one. Also, if the goods and services sold on foreign e-commerce platform are owned or provided by an Indian resident or an Indian permanent establishment, they will not be subjected to the equalization levy. These two conditions. Okay. Uh, will not attract any equalization levy one it is provided by an indian resident or it is provided by an indian permanent establishment no equalization levy will be applied now moving on edible oil prices we can see that the edible oil prices of most of the commodities have increased let it be palm oil let it be uh, groundnut oil or sunflower oil now this is uh, because of the supply chain crisis earlier it was because of covid 19 and now it is because of this russian tension okay now recently also a national mission on uh, expanding edible oil was introduced 
Now that is a centrally sponsored scheme and it has a special focus on the northeast and Andaman Nicobar Islands. There are plans to introduce uh, oil palm cultivation in these regions of oil seeds and oil palms. Okay, uh, please read about the scheme, uh, which ministry is it under and uh, other uh, criterion about it. Okay, now why is oil palm in, uh, edible oil in the news? The war in Ukraine has driven up the prices of many commodities northwards, including those of edible oils. Most of the sunflower uh, oil supplies that we get in India, they were coming from Ukraine because less than 25% of the sunflower that is used in India for oil is produced within the country domestically. The small uh, percentage is only produced domestically. With the Ukraine being war hit, the supplies have been completely stopped. We don't have enough supplies in India anymore. Because of Ukraine being war hit, we don't have enough sub sunflower supplies. As sunflower oil supplies dwindle, consumers are invariably moving to groundnut and palm oils, which automatically increases their price. Why? Because sunflower has reduced, which means that sunflower is more expensive. And thus, people will automatically want to shift to simpler or lesser expensive uh, means of oil such as palm oil oil or uh, groundnut oil etc. And hence, because of this demand for these, uh, it increases their prices. Now, India's dependence on edible oil. India is the world's biggest vegetable oil importer. Please remember this fact currently. India imports about 60% of its edible oil needs, which uh, ensures that the country's uh, retail prices of edible oil are, you know, they are vulnerable to international pressures. In case something happens in Malaysia or some geopolitical tension happens around the world, edible oil prices in India will definitely shoot up. Now, India imports palm oil from Indonesia and Malaysia specifically, soya oil from Brazil and Argentina, and sunflower oil mainly from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure you know about edible oils. Now, in India, we have two sources of edible oils. One is the primary source of edible oil, which means that oil can be directly you know, uh, taken from these components, such as soya bean, rapeseed and mustard, groundnut, sunflower, safflower, these uh, entities need no processing in order to get edible oil. Whereas in the case of oil palm, coconut, rice bran, cotton seeds, tree born oil seeds, these need some processing and that is the reason why they are secondary sources of edible oil and not direct sources of edible oil. Now in India, major ch uh, challenges in oil seed production are that because we have mostly rain fed conditions. Uh, however, oil palm uh, edible oil needs, they are water guzzling crops, you know, they contaminate or they take up most of the ground water, they need a lot of water. And hence having rain fit conditions uh, makes it uh, difficult to cultivate oil seeds. Also there exists a high seed cost, uh, also low seed, seed replacement rate exists currently. What is the seed replacement rate? Seed replacement rate means what percentage of the farm seeds are being sown with purchased seeds rather than with farm saved seeds? Farm saved seeds are those seeds which are uh, taken from the harvest itself, while purchased seeds are those which are taken from the market. Now, low replacement rate means lower number of purchase seeds from the market and higher number of farm saved seeds. The problem with farm saved seeds is that uh, their, uh, their productivity is on the lower side. Their productivity keeps reducing because these seeds come with a terminator gene. Usually most of these high yield variety seeds, they come with a terminator gene which is injected by the uh, companies, the GM companies such as Monsanto. And hence, after one crop, the second crop cycle is never as good as the first crop cycle. That is why, um, you know, it is better to have purchase seeds rather than using uh, seeds from the farm produce itself. Next, Samarth. 
இட்ஸ் அ ஸ்பெஷல் ஆண்டர்பிரனர்ஷிப் ப்ரமோஷன் ட்ரைவ் ஃபார் உமன் ஆன் த கான்டெக்ஸ்ட் ஆஃப் இன்டர்நேஷ்னல் உமன்ஸ் டே த யூனியன் மினிஸ்டர் ஃபார் மைக்ரோ ஸ்மால் அண்ட் மீடியம் என்டர்பிரைசஸ் லான்ச் திஸ் சமர்த் ட்ரைவ் டு ப்ரமோட் ஆண்டர்பிரனர்ஷிப் அண்டர் உமன் அண்டர் த சமர்த் இனிஷியேட்டிவ் ஆஃப் த மினிஸ்ட்ரி ஓகே ப்ளீஸ் ரிமெம்பர் தட் திஸ் இஸ் நாட் அண்டர் த மினிஸ்ட்ரி ஆஃப் உமன் இட் இஸ் அண்டர் த மினிஸ்ட்ரி ஆஃப் மைக்ரோ ஸ்மால் அண்ட் மீடியம் என்டர்பிரைசஸ் அண்டர் த சமர்த் இனிஷியேட்டிவ் த ஃபாலோயிங் பெனிஃபிட்ஸ் வர் அவைலபிள் டு ஆஸ்பைரிங் அண்ட் எக்ஸிஸ்டிங் உமன் ஆண்டர்பிரனர்ஸ் ட்வெண்ட்டி பர்சன்ட் சீட்ஸ் இன் ஸ்கில் டெவலப்மெண்ட் ப்ரோக்ராம்ஸ் ட்வெண்ட்டி பர்சன்ட் ஆஃப் எம்எஸ்எம்இ பிஸ்னஸ் டெலிகேஷன் சென்ட் டு டொமெஸ்டிக் அண்ட் இன்டர்நேஷ்னல் எக்ஸிபிஷன்ஸ் அண்டர் த ஸ்கீம்ஸ் ஃபார் மார்க்கெட்டிங் அசிஸ்டன்ஸ் இம்ப்ளிமெண்டட் பை த மினிஸ்ட்ரி வில் பி டெடிக்கேட்டட் டு உமன் ஓன் எம்எஸ்எம்இஸ் ட்வெண்ட்டி பர்சன்ட் டிஸ்கவுண்ட் ஆன் ஆன்வல் ப்ராசஸிங் ஃபீஸ் ஆன் நேஷனல் ஸ்மால் இண்டஸ்ட்ரீஸ் கார்பரேஷன்ஸ் commercial schemes special drive for registration of women owned msmes under the udyam registration so women have a special benefit under this samarth uh, special entrepreneurship promotion drive for women these are the benefits that they get we have named them over here 20% better seats 20% of msme delegations will be reserved for women 20% discount on uh, processing fee of national small industries corporations uh, schemes and then special drive for uh, registration under udyam registration next moving on motor vehicles agreement again a very important topic a meeting was held recently between the three countries bangladesh india and nepal initially this motor vehicles agreement was thought to be signed between four countries which are bangladesh india nepal as well as bhutan however later on bhutan had several problems and had to sign out of it uh for operationalizing the motor vehicles agreement of the sub regional bangladesh bhutan india nepal grouping for the free flow of goods and people between the countries now bhutan has already announced that it is unwilling to sign this agreement bhutanese parliament was scared of this excessive motor vehicles entering into its boundaries and thereby polluting its environment and hence bhutan parliament rejected this idea of the motor vehicles agreement though initially its uh, political leaders had agreed for it the original bbin motor vehicles agreement was signed by all four countries in june 2015 but after objections in bhutan over sustainability and environmental concerns the bhutanese parliament decided not to endorse the plan as per the agreement member countries would allow vehicles registered in the other countries to enter their territory under certain terms and conditions okay customs and tariffs will be decided by the respective countries and these would be finalized at bilateral and trilateral forums hence customs and all they are decided by the countries itself individual countries decide the customs it's not that there won't be any customs they'll be decided by the countries and they'll be accepted to at bilateral uh, forums with the other countries or trilateral forums with the other countries okay it, the agreement is just to remove uh, excessive barriers uh, which are non tariff in nature non tariff barriers will be removed like excessive checking or uh, excessive need of permits uh, then transport of goods from one registration vehicle to another registration vehicle so all these non tariff barriers will be removed and uh, even customs and tariffs will be reduced as much as possible under this motor vehicles agreement now Uh, Asian Development Bank has supported the project as a part of its SASEC program South Asian Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation Program Now Asian Development Bank's headquarters is Manila and hence SASEC will also rolled out of Manila All these countries are a part of SASEC except Pakistan most of the South Asian countries are a part of SASEC Pakistan is not a part of it Okay uh no operationalizing the motor vehicles agreement by concluding a passenger and cargo protocol will help realize the full potential of trade and people to people connectivity between the bbin countries uh, bangladesh bhutan india and nepal by fostering greater sub regional cooperation moving on param ganga okay uh, param ganga is one of the latest super computers which was unveiled under the national super computing mission and it was unveiled by the center for uh, cdc i mean cdac okay uh, 
it's a supercomputer at IIT Roorkee with a computing capacity of 1.66 petaflops. Okay, the capacity of uh, normal computers is uh, measured in flops. While the capacity of uh, supercomputers is measured in petaflops. Okay. Now, Param Ganga will provide greater computational power to Indian scientists and will give a boost to research and development activities across various disciplines. The system is designed and commissioned by CDAC under the phase 2 of the National Supercomputing Mission. This National Supercomputing Mission has two phases. Phase 1 and Phase 2. This was under the Phase 2 of the mission. The National Supercomputing Mission is being steered jointly by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and the Department of Science and Technology. It is implemented by the... Though it is steered jointly by these uh, ministries, it is implemented by the Center for Depart Development of Advanced Computing and the IASC. The four pillars of National Supercomputing Mission are development of infrastructure, development of applications, research and development, human resource development. All of these are a part under it. It is under these two ministries but implemented by CDAC and IASC. The CDAC has been entrusted with the responsibility of designing, development, deployment and commissioning of supercomputing systems built under the build approach of the mission. Till now, the Center for Development of Advanced Computing has deployed 11 systems at IASC's, IIT's, IASCR, Pune, uh, Nabi Mohali and CDAC under NSM Phase 1 and Phase 2 with a cumulative computing power of more than 20 petaflops. Just like how we had discussed for the Param Ganga, it is about 1.66 petaflops. CDAC under Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the National Supercomputing Mission. It has, uh, you know, deployed supercomputers which are more than 20 petaflops till now. 